Hello friends, welcome to a brand new episode of the Ian Khan Show. This show is about the future, it's about innovation, technology, and really how to create tomorrow with all the knowledge and information that we can have today. As part of this series, I'm interviewing uh, contributors to the recent book, Aftershock. And today's guest is a good friend of mine, fellow futurist, and one of the world's most renowned authorities on futurism, Sohail Inayatullah. Please give a big hand to Sohail. Hi, Sohail Inayatullah, the futurist that I've been waiting to talk to. Welcome to the Ian Khan Show. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much, Ian. Great to connect. So, Sohail, this is happening because of Aftershock. We're connected. I have a coffee, too. We're literally bound yes. together by this yes. book that uh, John Schroeder has put together. And it's such a humbling and incredible experience for me to talk to everybody who's contributed to the book. So I'm having amazing conversations with everybody. And I've been waiting to speak to you because your pieces in the book, your piece is one of the longest and the most comprehensive piece. I loved reading it. I'm reading everyone's piece that I'm speaking to. So consider me a little bit well informed about what's happening, but I, I still cannot predict anything about tomorrow. Uh, it's been a great learning experience though. So you'll tell us about yourself. Your resume is so impressed. I want to see which parts of it will you highlight. Who, who are who is Sohail and Well, I want to do it in context to Tofla. I was a high school student at the International School of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And my high school 11th grade teacher, 12th grade teacher, Dr. Frank Shepard, showed us this video. And this is an amazing couple walking in a beautiful forest. Romantic music, you think, oh, this is so beautiful, serene. They sit down to have a picnic. The camera zooms in, they turn around, and they're robots. And for a 15-year-old, I said, oh, my God, what just happened? I mean, it was just stunning. And so that was really, Toffler forced us, disrupted our view of what romance in the future could be like. So he was really, as a high school student, the first time I, I would say conceptual futures. I was reading science fiction, but this was different. Science fiction was far away, way away. No, this is today, you're about to change. So that got me into futures thinking. And then I went to Hawaii in 1976, took a course in future studies by Jim Data. And then went on, did a master's in alternative futures. And part of that master's was an internship for six months with the Hawaii judiciary. And I stayed 10 years. So it was the intern who came to dinner and never left. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. So back in the day when you first watched Toffler's film, what was the world like back then? And, and when, when had the book? So the book came out about 50 years ago. Uh, and that's what we're... It was early 70s. It was early 70s. So, so yeah. technology as we see it today, it wasn't available everywhere. Like it, it really wasn't. It, it must have been quite a different The main era. thing then was after Vietnam War, there was issues around then, nuclearization, China is a large communist party. Those are some of the issues that everyone was talking about. It was about underdevelopment. Would the poor countries ever get wealthy? When I went as a high school student to Singapore to play basketball, there were people selling drugs on the street. After a basketball game, someone came up to me and said, would you like heroin? I said, no, I'm 15. I mean, it was just so stunning and inappropriate. I can't imagine in 2020 that ever happening in Singapore. It was a very different time then. Absolutely. So today we are here in 2020. And uh, by the time uh, this, this video goes uh, on air in, in the next few weeks, uh, I, I hope we've overcome uh, the impact of COVID-19, the immediate, you know, the world has at least opened up, but we're battling with something we would never have thought about that is going to happen at such a big scale. There's many um, uh, conspiracy theories. There's many theories of, you know, what has happened, why has it happened? And the media is full of it. There's, there's all kinds of information available online, but in terms of predicting tomorrow, in terms of creating a, an informed decision about the future. I think for organizations especially, I, and I've been reading your piece here as well, there has to be a process, isn't that right? Yeah, you want to, our notion is futures literacy. So if someone says, what do you think about the future? I said, well, why do you care if they're brilliant in physics, 
that doesn't mean they have literacy about the future. So futures literacy has a structured process. And we take organizations, individuals, countries through this foresight process. So prediction is kind of the first part. It's a fascination about the future. And we want to make it rigorous, robust, and ultimately far more useful to the person and the decision maker. So if you look back at the 60s, it was all about prediction. And by 70s, 80s, they said, oh my God, all those predictions were wrong. Partly because once you predict, it's self-fulfilling and people change. So then we move to scenarios. By the 80s, 90s, the last 20 years, it said, well, it's not just about scenarios. What do you do with the scenario? Are we able to make the transition if we see a future we like or a future we don't like? So we've now moved to narrative foresight. What stories can we tell that create the difference? So the methodology I use is cause alert analysis or CLA, always finding the underneath underlying metaphor that helps me make the change. So for example, one group, uh, this is a story I tell a lot, we were looking at what are the implications of alternative meat, cellular agriculture, in vitro meat. And so it was funded by a nation state and we ran the farming federation and scientists through that. And I said, okay, let's pretend 50% of people by 2030 are vegan or involved in beyond meat type stuff, right? That's a fair emerging issue. Mm -hmm. So then I said, well, what do you think is going to happen? What should we do? And they were a bit, I wouldn't say trivial, but they were playful a little bit. They said, well, scenario one was, well, we kill the vegans. I said, okay, that's yeah. done. Yeah. What's scenario two? They said, well, <laughs> kill the scientists. <laughs> and I said, well, what's scenario three? They said, well, kill the coffee drinkers. I said, what's the correlation? They said, they're the early adopters, inner city coffee drinkers, early adopters of new technologies. So then it became very clear to me the scenarios themselves or predictions themselves have no utility. Because once we gave that, they went back to defend, defend, defend. My way of life as a farmer is being challenged. This is scary stuff. I'm going to shut down and eliminate the threat. So our goal then is, of course, they feel injustice. They're not ready for this. Mm. Predictions are useless. Scenarios are useless. We have to find ways where they can innovate, become part of the process, and enhance their power. So foresight really done well is not about prediction, it's about emancipation. So our goal with people who don't have power, how do we get them to move towards innovation, to move towards feeling their co -creation? And so uh, you've, you've, you've authored a lot of different papers and you've, you've you know, uh, authored very defined pieces of um, content that we can use as a reference for decades. Like you've, you've literally created you. a body of, uh, body of knowledge there. What have been some of your experiences when, um, when, when cre uh, maybe, maybe a, a use case, which you just mentioned one as well, but something more, something more. I want to, I want to visit our uh, viewers to understand that the process of being a futurist or, or having foresight or creating or delivering an outcome or through a scenario situation, there's, there's a lot to it. And, and there's a lot of unknowns to it as well, because many times people expect that as a futurist, you know it all, and you're going to come out with a prediction like Nostradamus, and you're, and you're going to prophesize something. Uh, and that's how people look at generally as futurists. I think futures generally work on a lot of data and a lot of information. I don't know if Toffler and how much information did Toffler had back in the day when he wrote, wrote all, you know, wrote his books, but help me understand this. Help me understand this. The Toffler era was different, right? They were trying to get people to think about what now has become normal scenarios, visioning, disruption. In our era, it's very different. What I tell people, our goal is not to be the smartest one in the room. I don't have to be smarter than anyone in the room. I have to have the ability to get very smart people to think differently. Mm. So I'm not there to impress them with data. I'm there to get them, okay, you're good at this, but maybe you're not good at that. And so this is the challenge of what I call the use future. A practice we're doing, it doesn't work, but we keep on doing it. And that practice is uncomfortable to let go of because we have a narrative that tells us here's how we should do it. 
So I work with schools everywhere. I ask them, tell me what your core metaphor is. And they say things like castle surrounded by hungry wolves. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're in a beautiful castle, the minister, the secretary of education, all the principals. We're collegial. We have a community, but outside of the hungry wolves, parents, teachers, students, media. So then is that a used future? Because they're not engaged with stakeholders, right? They're defending. So then we ask, okay, that's not working for you. What's a better story? Is it the playground? Is it a circus? Is it from castle to, to a gaming system? So there's no right answer here. When I was working in Norway, working with the ministry there, they suggested, well, actually, it's the jazz band. And the jazz band, every student, we engage so they become excellent. But the real value added is all the students working together to create new music, or in fact, in our language, new innovation, new value. So this is the structure of processing what today is the used future. Once I figure that out, then I go to what's the disruption? What might change? But we know, you know, is it new technology? Is it demographic shift? Is it pandemic? Once I've done that, then I ask, okay, well, how do you make sense of all this information? Then we have scenarios. And then we go to vision, where do you wish to go? And then how did we get there? So it's a very structured process that helps people get a handle on foresight. Otherwise, it's endless ideas. No one knows what to do. It's all scattered. And the goal in that scattered game is who's the expert? Here is co-created shared knowledge, which gets everyone involved and excited. Absolutely. Now, in, in the book, in, um, and I should point out to everybody that we're talking because, um, Suhail, you've written a really nice, um, almost an ending uh, article in Aftershock, uh, a book that's recently come out. And Aftershock was put together by a friend, John Schroeder, who was inspired by what um, Alvin Toffler did about 50 years ago with his book, Future Shock. And so he reached out to a ton of people. I think there's about 50 plus uh, futurists, experts um, who came together, wrote content, wrote their thoughts and ideas. And it's all here in Aftershock. And we're talking because we both are in Aftershock and we're capturing what Aftershock is all about. Now, you've written a lot about this. And I was reading, you know, the mantra. There's, there's a few different processes that you've written about. So there's six steps, uh, I believe, as far as I can, uh, I read uh, in your in your methodology of creating the future, you touched on some of them before, but but there's a very specific um, process that you've talked about making the vision real, the narrative which you just talked about, the mantra process, and you write many many amazing things in there. Um, I, if can you help us understand your process that you've designed over over so many years and decades of experience? Uh, I've learned from many teachers, Johan Galtung, Dater, oh. Elise Bolding, Evan Tolfer. So what happens, say you come up with your country, we've done this for countries, for mayors, corporations, and you come up with this vision and you've now done your scenarios, right? Here's the no change, marginal change, adaptive change, radical change. So you've done all this work. Yeah. But our conclusion, people say, well, what do I do next? And that's the zone of proximal your zone of control, zone of proximal development. So then they say, well, what do you do next depends on you. So this, well, what do we do? Yeah. So then there's this narrative and mantra process. So I had one person, an executive, took one of my courses and we were looking at the future of technology. It was for a high tech company. And she said, this is great, but I can't think about that as in you know, the CFO. I said, so what are you thinking about? She was actually, I'm very angry at my husband. I go, I said, okay, tell me more. She goes, well, I said, well, what's your, she told me the situation. Then I said, so what's the narrative? She's the narrative issue is I want to leave him because he wasn't there when I, she had cancer. Hmm. So I said, well, why don't you just leave him? She goes, well, that conflicts with her other self being the good girl. Her mom said, never leave the marriage. Hmm. So then we said, okay, what's the metaphor you want? She goes, I want to jump in a Ferrari and get out. So now we're going from the old story, which is imprisoned by the situation, to a better story being in the Ferrari and getting out. So that's the rational part, right? 
That's the rational decision making. Here's a better story with better strategy. So if it's a Ferrari, I said, what do you do? She goes, well, I file the divorce papers. I do all that stuff, done. And I'm out the next day. But that conflicts with one of her other selves. So organizations often can't transform because they have conflicting visions, conflicting identities. So in the mantra process, we take them through this process where they go deep into their, to their self from the future, their deeper self. And there's a sound from any tradition you can use. And then her new story was in a carriage with the door open. So meaning she's going to gently go away, not with anger, and he's invited to come with her. So this becomes the transformational part. Yeah. At the CEO level, I had one CEO, and I've told this story before. He said, I never know when I enter a business meeting what the rules are anymore. If it's in Beijing, it's these rules. In Jakarta, it's these rules. In New York, it's these rules. I no longer know. So I said, okay, what's your defining metaphor? He goes, well, it used to be I'm a tennis player who's perfect on grass court. I said, great. He goes, I no longer know which court I'm about to play on. So merely doing scenario planning just tells me how the world is changing. Rise of Asia, peer-to-peer, -peer, informatics, robotics, pandemics. He goes, I know all that. So then his better story was the man who can play on many courts. So you can play on clay, grass, etc. So then I said, okay, if that's your new story, what do you need to do? He said, oh, I need to up my skill set around emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence. So the narrative sets up the next steps. So we do the scenarios and then we can't find the new story. Then we enter a kind of altered state where we go deep within and that sets up where we need to go further. So traditional strategy was all data-driven, like a chess set. Yeah. We're saying, no, the new strategy should be like mountaintop, looking at alternatives, then going deep in the cave, finding the new story, then coming out and being of service. So as, as I think as, a, as you mentioned earlier as well, uh, what you do is you're, you're, you're not the smartest person in the room and you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. No. And you, you just want to bring out the best in all the people who are out there driving an organization, doing whatever uh, they're doing. And that's, that's such a huge, um, that's so profound for me to learn because let me, you know, generally you, you look at, okay, what are, you know, as a futurist, what are the main technology trends? Okay. What's coming down the pipeline? And it's all about technology. Um, it, I'll tell you about something interesting. I have, um, I, I've been working on something. It's called the future readiness score. It's an Fantastic. initial stages of uh, kind of development and it's out there, but it's not out there. And the future readiness score is a, a metric, a KPI, a number that organizations can get after they do an assessment of eight different pillars, Q and A, do you have this? No. Okay. Plus five. Do you have this? No. Minus five. And so Very on. Very clever. So Love it. So one pillar of that is technology. Just one pillar. The rest are engagement. It's an era of changing, you know, how engagement works. Engagement is sales, marketing, uh, relationship building, PR, brand. It's all stacked under engagement. You now, you also have a people pillar. People is how do you hire people? How do you uh, attract the talent that resonates with your message as an organization? How do you sync? How do you, what's your corporate culture? And so on. Two, you've got uh, accountability as one. You've got uh, execution as one pillar. Uh, you've got um, culture as one pillar. And so all of these come together. And so only one of them, I couldn't make everything technology-based, but one of yeah. them for me is technology. How, how, yes. How much technology do you use? What platforms do you use? And so yeah. in the end, an organization gets something called a future readiness score. My score is 850. And then I categorize them into one of four categories that you're uh, you know, still growing, you're up ahead, you're way ahead. And I really want organizations to have a, a measurement of where they are today and where they're going, because I feel a, a measurement of the future is missing. No, I agree with you 100%. Right? So when we change the story, we say, okay, you have a new narrative. How will you measure it? Because mm. we count what we count. So I'm 100% agree with you. So I always ask them, if you change, you do your scenarios, you do your visioning, do the metaphor process, you now have a new narrative. 
So if your new narrative education is like a jazz band, well, how will you measure that? Because if you don't find a new measurement, just what you're doing, the accountants will come in and they'll measure what they used to do. All the future's work is wasted. Yeah. yeah. So we must, so I'm, yes, so the future readiness score, so I say, here's the vision, how will you make it real? What's a better new measurement? Yeah. And I just I think that's that, brilliant. Thank you. And I just feel that the, you know, the, uh, the, the big hoo-ha with, the, with understanding the future needs to be simplified a little bit because people always have, an unrealistic expectation that you're going to do some magic as a futurist or as a, as a person with foresight, but it, we have to be practical. We have to be real with coming up with all this knowledge, all these scenarios, all the possibilities so that people can action it. I was part of a, of an exercise by uh, one of the government bodies in Dubai. I think it was last year and they deal with roads and transportation and what this will be. So they were doing an exercise with uh, and I was just part of it. It wasn't run by me. I was part of the whole thing. Uh, where will Dubai be by 2071? And that's the formation yeah. of their, it's 100 years of their, of the nation. Yeah. So centenary. And it was incredible. Uh, you know, you come up with four, four different scenarios. Where would the transportation, how will people live? They'll live in a bubble. They'll, you know, a bubble dome. That was one of the scenarios. Or they live underground. And then you start understanding what the direction of the organization should be, the government should be. Then leaders start um, you know, thinking in that direction, even if they haven't done that. So I think doing this process should be something that organizations do every year. Every year, management and C-level leaders should get together and say, hey, where are we today uh, as compared to where? Look at COVID-19. I mean, what are your thoughts on how this changes everything for organizations there, there's no playbook for there's no pandemic playbook where do you think uh we should go next i mean in terms of what you were saying and linking to toffler when i started out first you know in my in the 80s just starting to do workshops with my own professor it was a hard sell and i remember my first speech the ceo fell asleep my second speech, the chief justice fell asleep. Oh my God. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I in the room and I just kept on going. You know, I was not responsive to the changing world. And then finally, learned, okay, they actually don't want long speeches. They want insights. Now in that era, futures was what crazy people talked about, visionaries, dreamers. And then once you start with the fall of Berlin Wall, Asia financial crisis, SARS, global financial crisis, internet, genomics, it actually suddenly, the story we've been telling that we're in different times no longer seems strange. Like if you look at one of the, the groups that were the quickest to decide on a death was Taiwan. Why? I was in Taiwan during SARS. So oh. they remember that event, they said, okay, we got caught out once, we will not be caught out twice. The minute the data came in from Wuhan, they were ready. So this is where the future happened once and you think, okay, we're going to be prepared. Option two, those of us who've been working in the pandemic field, everyone's been saying this for 20 years. It's not a black swan, but it's still considered something crazy. So that's our task in the future. So how do I get prime ministers, governors, ministers to actually, this is not a crazy event, be prepared. So when we succeed in there, we've done it with policing, with emerging services, then they're ready and they all tell us it was much easier. Mm -hmm. We were mostly ready, mentally ready, strategically ready. Even if it's still difficult, we're kind of ready and we can act in wiser ways. And the wiser ways to me means I'm inclusive of everyone as opposed to here's the good guys, here's the bad guys. There's a problem. We solve it. So this is where Futures adds. Uh, Toffler set up the framework, but, you know, he wasn't around in a sense to see how dramatically it's changed. Yeah. Yeah. And so now for me, with your question, our challenge, the scenarios I've been working on with the piece, was scenario one is zombie apocalypse. That's what it feels like to people, right? Yeah. Everyone on the run. Zombies yeah. are coming. Oh, yeah. Scenario two is the big pause. We rest this year. Next year, we're on warp drive level and work 50 conferences per day. Yeah, yeah. The scenario three is the global health reawakening. So the year of rest leads to systemic change where we look at What's wrong with capitalism? We look at climate change. We look at our own lives and say, here's the things I learned during it. Here's how we want to change. 
So scenario three becomes a real possibility of something different happening. So that's where the one I want to see occur. And scenario four is it mutates, mutates, seven years, depression, recession, we're all depressed forever. Mm. I mean, so the scenario process, okay, here's four possibilities. Where do I want to play? Yeah. If I'm ahead of a company, well, do I want to be business as usual and light speed next year? Or here's my chance to be part of the global health awakening. Mm. What am I doing? How am I treating people? That becomes a really exciting place for innovation. I completely agree. I completely agree. I, I really, my take on uh, COVID is, is the same as many other people, but I do feel it's, a, it, 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 it's more of a testing ground. It's, it's, it's uh, for us to test our resilience. It's for us to find out who we are and what we're made of. It's, I think for, of course, organizational wise business and companies, it's all we know, it's funny, you know, they're how they are, are suffering. But I think a big test for people to know how they work under pressure that is that has come from somewhere unbelievable and it's it's getting you battle ready it's getting you hardened um, you know in all our futures workshops, we put them in gaming situations. I remember ten years ago, I was in Ottawa with r c m p yeah, and we ran them through a whole range of gaming stuff, and I have one game where it's called a sarkar game. some group get worker tools, some get weapons, some get books, some get money. And the goal is to create a successful civilization. And 70% of the time, the warriors get the fake guns and kill everyone. Because yeah. they get frustrated with the lack of innovation. <laughs> and this time, I was amazed. I let the game on go an extra 10 minutes, and no one would kill themselves. Everyone kept on negotiating for better outcomes. And of course, RCMP, like any group, has issues. And I said, ask them later, you folks are different. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I, and then they talked about as Canadians, as police leaders, they're trained first to mediate, to engage. Mm -hmm. So their narrative, and they told me the history of their narrative, was so different the history of other other policing organizations. Mm -hmm. So it's something really good where you're working. So the gaming situations get people ready. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just cognitive. So we're doing whole of whole of body, whole of mind, whole of spirit futures. Um, I love it. Um, I'm actually right now. I since COVID, just interesting. Uh, maybe it is for you. I I am running a series of live stream, uh, leadership live stream. COVID nineteen leadership live streams, or every Wednesday, I'm getting together five more people. I'm the sixth one, and we meet on a live stream and we talk about a specific industry. And so people have been asking. Brilliant. Well, they've been asking. And my entire take is I want us to get ready for after COVID-19 is over. How do we bounce back? And some people yeah. say, why are you thinking about that? We're still entering into it. And I say, because we must. That's what we should focus on. Because otherwise, we'll just be depressed and sad and we'll just go crazy. You've got to focus on the future, on something big. Because we will be there. Let's, you know. So it's, it's creating a little bit of movement. And I love it. We've, we, we have about about 500 plus people on the live stream and it's wow. really nice to talk to them. I mean, that's our role as futurists. Hmm. Definitely there's emergency manager people, right? Hmm. They're doing the frontline stuff. There's people doing the good mac the big macro patterns. That's important. But all role is to say, yes, afterwards, exactly what you're doing. Let's prepare for the solutions. And we don't discount what others are doing, but we're doing the foresight part. Hmm. And that's the value added we bring to the planet, to every organization, helping prepare for the new future. Yeah. And it's fantastic what you're doing. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I know we're out of time. I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but uh, tell me a little bit about, um, if you had to give uh, young people advice on how to become futurists, and I really believe everybody is one, what should they do? Like, what's the framework of life they should be in to be able to say, this is what I want. This is what I can do. This is where I'm going. Uh, if you, if, if you know, if you know what I mean. There's two answers. One is the fictitious inappropriate answer. I'll give you that first. <laughs> the inappropriate answer is go join organized crime. Mm. Wow. That's when I, I speak at law enforcement meetings all the time. And that's how I start off my speech. Yeah. And they say, why? Well, it's adaptable, agile, flexible, looking for emerging issues, always where the openings are, market sensitive. And given the rate of technological growth, 
that's where the money and the action will be. And of course, then everyone gets depressed. It's the way I'm a senior detective. Don't tell people to go over my price. Let me step back. That was the joke answer. The real answer is figure out your life narrative. Where do you wish to be? Do the scenarios. Start to work on your vision. You know, and so this is that balance between here's where I want to be and here's how the world is changing, right? Those in the Islamic world say, trust in Allah, tie your camel. You know, you're doing both, living from dream and vision and very clear about how the material world is changing and what the possibilities are. I ran something for some young students uh, two years ago. And the one I remember the most, I said, so what do you want to be? She was 15. I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? She goes, well, I'm 25. I want to be the CEO of a tea company. There's these green tea companies all over Asia. I said, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Jolly Bean. I said, that's, we did the visioning part. She is very clear. Ten years to get there. And I said, okay, what are you doing today to get there? She said, of course, math and science. I said, great. And I said, what's your core metaphor? And then she stopped. And she said, oh, I'm in a room where the blinds are shut. It's a dark room. And then she burst out in tears. Mm -hmm. And her friends with her started to cry. And I said, so, you know, I waited. I said, why is that narrative wrong? She goes, it just hit me. You can't become a CEO in 10 years with math and science as your core skills if the room is shut. Mm. Wow, very interesting, yeah. yeah. Then I said, okay, look at your friends around you. And then she said, I said, what's the better narrative? She goes, let the sun shine in. Now she has a story, but in our work, what does the story mean to the strategy? She said, okay, I need to learn other skills not just science and technology, math skills, I need to learn emotional skills, et cetera, et cetera. So this is with young people, it's figuring out, here's where I want to go. Am I doing the right material things? If not, what do I need to do differently? So clearly avoid organized crime, do something that helps people and get the skill set. Absolutely. I really have big hopes from uh, young people and you know the next generation. And we're doing all we can, but but they're the ones that'll... Um, I think take over, and I I really feel they need all the all the skills that we can give them. Very intelligent. I love the the newer kids and gen newer generations. They're all very hundred times clever than I am. My my younger nieces, nephews, my kids, and so <laughs> yeah. it, it needs to be seen what the world of tomorrow is like. Um, so I'll thank you so much. Uh, where can we find more I about you or uh, look you up? Uh, Metafuture.org. Or if you Google Sahel Futurist, and we have a new online course, Meta Future School at teachable.com. So if the people want to learn the skills, they just go there and do that. Okay. Okie dokes. All right. Thank That's you so much. Thing. I love it. And uh, everybody, get yeah. a copy of Aftershock. It's available on uh, on. I have my copy here, there too. There you go. Aftershock is the book to read. I, I love it. Thank you, Sohail, for being a contributor here. And uh, it's awesome to, to read it, to go through it. Uh, I think it's got incredible stuff in there. Suhail, thank you so much. I'm indebted to you. I okay. really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody's going to love this episode. So you take care and we'll hear from you soon. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com. 